learning. 100% had been a general EFL teacher before becoming a business English teacher. So that seems to be the pathway to the business English teacher. Seemed to be the pathway. <coughs> What I used during this uh, investigation was to use the techniques of management training rather than pedagogy. And management training uh, come up with these characteristics observed in poor trainers. So a highly directed style of teaching, inaccurate assessment or assumptions, etc., etc., displaying impatience or intolerance. Lacking it down towards the bottom. Lacking sociability and interest in trainees. And having an untidy appearance. These, this is the world we are teaching in. Maybe we should take notice of what they expect from their trainers. Uh, lacking in verbal and oral skills is always a disadvantage when you're teaching language. I find. And uh, refusing to accept criticism or advice on teaching methods. We all know those people, don't we? In fact, we probably are those people. <laughs> Characteristics observed in good trainers, well, obviously the opposite of the previous list. Technical competence in the area being taught. A natural ability. Are teachers born or made? Are business English teachers born or made? And then perhaps what you would expect, a high level of interpersonal skills, good listeners and questioners, interested in people. And then down at the bottom, accepting a share of accountability for the trainee's future performance. <coughs> Notice it doesn't say delegating accountability, nor does it say accepting all of the accountability. It is um, accepting the fact that it's a team effort and we share the accountability Sometimes it's the student's responsibility, as well as our own. Management training has two aspects. Soft skills approach, soft orientation, and a hard orientation. And these are the definitions which are given in, in management training manuals. Soft orientation, an open, aware, receptive stance, which is specifically used for uh, diagnosing individual needs and strategies and interpersonal dynamics. The hard orientation, more focused, instructive, directive stance, and it's effective, it's effective as you see, for narrowing the meanings of the interactions, uh, classification, interpersonal dynamics, individual needs and strategies. So we would all hope, I think, that we are Softly orientated, but maybe hard orientation is also essential at times. But I argue that any training should have a soft skills focus. We focus on relationship building, cultural awareness, intuition. I always get into trouble for talking about intuition. People say you need to plan very carefully. Yes, you do, but you need to leave space and not over plan. And so perhaps the best way to approach this is with planned spontaneity. Listening skills. Have you ever recorded yourself teaching? See how long, time yourself, see how long you talk. And whether it's different between a one-to-one -one class and a small group class. Or a large group. Motivation techniques. Planning versus spontaneity. Confidentiality. Can they trust you? Not only with their personal secrets, but also with the company secrets. Presentation skills. You may have a wonderful piece of work, but if it's on the scrap of paper with the corner torn off, is that going to appeal to a business person? <laughs> is that namby pamby liberal uh, thinking of the, what's happened yesterday or conservative or socialist teacher speak no it's not 
because if you look at management training manuals and management training courses, that's the sort of thing that they include. This is from a foundation course <coughs> recognized by the National <coughs> Leadership and Management for training managers. It's quite soft skills based. There's quite a soft orientation to that. We have permission to be soft on our managers. <coughs> How do companies manage language training? Well, in, in 1990, it was sometimes the HR department who would decide that as part of your raft of skills, you need language. That was sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Sometimes there was a training department within the HR department who would focus more on the specific needs for training. If they included language training as part of training, I always felt I was onto a winner because it meant they saw it as an integral part rather than a separate part of the training, professional development of the, of the manager. When you get a language training department, my heart usually sinks because it usually means we don't think this is important enough to include it in the general strategy of the company. We'll put a secretary in charge of it who happens to speak English and you are then having to talk with them about linguistic analysis of their students. I'm being a little hard maybe, but that's my experience. But the worst question that I'm often asked, I talked to somebody about this yesterday. Frequently I go to training managers and they will say to me, um, if we send you a student to do a one-to-one -one course for 40 hours, how many words will they learn? <laughs> the answer is 427, by the way. <laughs> because I thought if I was going to be asked a stupid question, I would have an answer ready. 427, it's quite good because LTS in Bath only say 360, so we always <laughs> it's fair. So yes, language training departments. Um, there's a department head. That can be quite good because they say, okay, my department needs to work in this area, and therefore I will put the money there from my budget. But then they fall out with the head of training who says, I'm in charge of this. You then get a line manager who at the executive appraisals every year decides you need to learn English and you can have problems of motivation. The individual manager themselves at the executive appraisal says, I need to learn English. We had a, a, in our center, we had a, a student last week uh, from France. He had tried for seven years to be sponsored by his company for a one week language training. That's how hard it can be sometimes. And then the CEO. The CEO can decide the company is going to learn English and then disappear and leave everyone else to try and sort it out. It's very good if the company, if the CEO sets the example and also learns English or speaks English very well. But very often they don't. And the, the real strategy is you will all learn. And usually it's all of the above, or none of the above, or two of them, often in conflict. So as business English teachers, we not only have to be good in the classroom, we have to be good out of the classroom as well. 